interview with John Warner, the uh, creative director for Anthem? Which one? There's been tons of interviews I've seen recently. It is the Game Informer Lingering Questions on Anthem video. It's 45 minutes long, and they just posted it yesterday. No. Um, so, as again, once again, I'm on Game Informer's dick uh, again. <laughs> uh, I just, I don't want... I don't want Joe Juba and Ben Hansen to think that I'm angling for a job, but if you need someone, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to work for cheap. Unfortunately, I already have a career. I'm used to having a salary, so I can't be an intern. But you know, if you're willing to match my current salary to have you me, would leave you? our lucrative podcast for Game Informer. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, our podcast isn't that lucrative, but yeah, it could hey, give be us money one day. Uh- <laughs> um, no, I, I'm just I'm such a fan. Every time I see their coverage, I think, holy crap, this is really what I would be doing uh, if I was doing interviews. I thought Ben Han- Ben Hansen actually asked really good questions. A um, couple of interesting tidbits out of that, uh, in particular to Ben Hansen's line of questioning. Towards the end, he asked about Mac Walters. Well, technically, he asked about the Andromeda development crew. He said, how many of Androm- How much of Andromeda's team moved over to Anthem? Uh, John Warner said, a lot. He said, what about Mac Walters? What's Mac Walters doing? Is he working on Anthem? And John Warner kind of stumbled a little bit. He kind of said, oh, yeah, yeah, he's kind of he's kind of working on that. And Ben Hansen said, oh, uh, on what? I mean, what, what, is he wor- what part of it is he working on? And he's like, well, he's kind of like an overall IP, kind of IP d- director. And he's like, of Anthem? or just like in general and he's like well like what's his title Ben Hansen goes does he have a title and um, John Warner kind of tried to play it off as like you know Grand Poobah Grand Vizier kind of a joke thing and Ben Hansen's like no really come on like what is he doing and he's like well technically he's still creative director and he's like of Anthem because John Warner's the creative director of Anthem Mm -hmm. and John Warner goes well of of the project that he's working on Ah. And I was like, ah, oh, that's not Dragon Age, because I don't think Mac Walters has ever worked directly on, or maybe he was one of the associate writers on Dragon Age Origins. I don't remember. I the, the Dragon Age is currently lacking a creative <clears throat> director, but they like they've already said Dragon Age, so I, I, I'm surprised that they're not just connecting the two. So is there a mysterious like? That's what third? I'm getting at. If he didn't say Dragon Age, it must be something else. That's that's interesting. Um, so there was that, and then also uh, I, I felt we should talk about it because now as Anthem as the Anthem developments continue, I'm worried about like correcting the record on things that I've said or things that we've said. Uh-huh. Uh, so Ben Hansen asked John Warner directly, "Will there ever be a point in time uh, post launch when Anthem will have an offline mode?" Uh, John Warner said definitively, "No, there will not." Okay. Uh, and which is weird because he answered a lot of questions with we'll see or TBD or we might think about that. This was one of the few questions he said yes or no to directly. He did not mm-hmm. hesitate. He said no. Okay. I guess it's some way the game is designed it just inherently cannot be offline then. Yeah, which bummed me out because like I, when I listened to the episode, I think it was our last episode, when you mentioned the SimCity comparison mm-hmm. of like, the, I was so excited. You gave me hope. I was like, <laughs> yes, that's a good point. They did that. Oh, uh, I mean, I... I would believe that what he said, no, but they technically they did say the same thing about SimCity. Like, I don't I don't want to give hope when there is none, but no, give me hope, Katie. Come on. (laughs) Now now I remember that, too. I'm like, oh, yeah, there was that. That was why it was controversial, because they refused to do it at first. Yeah. And then like mods came out where they cracked it and stuff like that. So maybe like modders, if you're really into it, you figure out how to crack it. Maybe you'll, you know, (laughs) break the way for everyone else. If anybody can do it, it's Wavebend. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> our old, our old buddy Wade Ben. To, but um, I think that was really about. Oh, and then the other, the last one that I found to be somewhat interesting. Um, he mentioned it was a weird comparison because he was talking about the differences in the way that some of the people have talked about romances. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark Dara and uh, John Warner have kind of said, "Well, no romances." And then Casey Hudson kind of said, "Well." No romances. We don't want to promise a romance of Bioware caliber that people expect and then not deliver. There's kind of flirtation. There's relationships, etc. And then John Warner compared it oddly to KOTOR 1. He said, you know, yeah, he said, like, you know, in Knights of the Old Republic, like, you get to have relationships with that crew. You get to, he even kind of said, like, Bastila, which to me, Bastila is a romance. And then he said, like, you know, but it's not it's not to the level of other Bioware games, but it's kind of like KOTOR 1. And I was like, huh. To me, KOTOR 1 has romances then. Like, you yeah, can romance like, Karth and Bastila. 
Yeah, I think there's, like, a wiki on, uh, like, how to romance, you know, those people. Because I remember when I tried to play, like, I was all into Karth because the other two were women, and I <laughs> didn't want to do that. Oh, yeah, so. Juhani. I, I, I said Karth and Basil. I forgot about Juhani. Yeah, I think everyone does because she's a bit scary looking. But... And she's a cat, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I remember her voice being weird. Is that just me? Am I making it up? It's been so long since I tried to play that game. Anyway, but, um, well, okay. I wonder if they're... I wonder if this is either a backtracking and they've suddenly added it, or if it was there the entire time. I think it's possible that maybe they've added it. I mean, that was the whole point, right? They keep saying, like, well, we might add stuff. We might add new adventures with the companion that you like. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're pivoting quickly. Oh, like, just now I was looking at Twitter, and uh, Mark Dara, who's been... St- he's still answering questions. It's been, like, almost a month. Anyway... But, he doesn't uh, some- sleep. He's just for one month straight. No sleeping, no eating, no showering. He just, he's just connected to Twitter. <laughs> But uh, someone asked him, uh, like, uh, is it, I think specifically it was worded, is it time to, like, go over characters yet? Because I want to know about characters. And he said no. So they're specifically not going over characters for a reason. So I don't know if they're still building them or what. I know, like, um, the the demo that came out. This episode is not about Anthem. What are we doing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the demo that came out, you were introduced to a couple characters. So I, there are some. I just wondered. I don't know. I think the Bioware team has done a great job of, con- of you know, we have gone, what, a full year of just almost nothing but pure speculation. And over the past month or so, they've actually been delivering info and info. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just thought, like, you know, because we're not going to do another dedicated Anthem episode, I don't want that, that Are lingering. We, oh, we might. We might. But okay. we, I, I, know, I know we're probably not going to do one for the next four episodes, right? Because we've, we've kind of semi got or three or four episodes that we have semi planned out. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure, like, you know, we didn't say anything and then go, oh, man, information came out after that and it's totally flipped what we were predicting. Mm-hmm. Um, Surprisingly, we are human and sometimes what we say is very, very wrong. <laughs> I mean, we could be human, as we established before we started recording. We you might be a replicant. <laughs> <laughs> I, without the recording of me, like, me sounding like a robot, that makes no sense. Out of so for, for people who <laughs> couldn't who couldn't hear that part, as soon as we got on the uh, Skype call, well, not Skype call, but we use Google Hangouts. But as soon as we got on the call, uh, Katie sounded a bit like a Cylon with that like weird modulation. Yeah, that always happens to me. If you know how to fix that, hit me up because I've changed computers and mics. I think at this point it's just me. But anyway, um, let's get to what we're actually supposed to talk about. Let's do it. <laughs> Uh, so today what we wanted to do, I th- this has been highly requested. Um, hopefully we can get through all of the choices because I there's a lot of them. But uh, specifically debating choices in Dragon Age Inquisition. So I'm talking about, I think th- the major ones we get is the uh, the ruler for Orle, the wardens, uh, t- to drink of the well of sorrows or not, uh, Cole, and I think that was about it, right? Oh, uh, disbanding the Inquisition or keeping it. So, uh, where do you want to begin? Um, do we go <clears throat> chronologically, or do we go for the one that's got the most meat? Let's go for the one that has the most meat, but I don't know what that is. What do you feel is the one that's like the most well, that we, requires we, the most conversation? Uh, we almost pretty much started uh, just talking about it off off uh, recording. Uh, the ruler of Orle, because you have an opinion that I think is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to start, I guess. Um, so I lean Gaspard heavily. Um, more recently, I think that's kind of like that's like a more recent development. Um, mm-hmm. I just thought he was a douche at first. I know I didn't go with him on my first playthrough because I just felt like his accent and the posturing. I wasn't a fan mm-hmm. of him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's I think it's just been, you know, I try to make all of my decisions sort of based on role play more than anything else. Um, no, I just thought that Gaspard eventually became, like, the more pragmatic choice. I understand mm-hmm. he's not exactly a good dude. Uh, he's kind of a maniac in some sense. But I also just think, like, Orle is in possibly the most precarious um, possibly the mm-hmm. most precarious situation that they've been in in generations and that they need mm-hmm. kind of a firm hand. Okay. So why why can't Celine do that? Or Briella? She's a weak bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, not Riala. <laughs> not Riala. Celine. Celine just strikes me as being that totally like 
she is royalty, and, and I'm a real. I don't. I'm not a fan of people in funny hats with jewels on, and just mm-hmm. um, not a big fan of like monarchies and such. And so, like, Gasp- I'm not. A, I'm not a huge fan of like military dictatorships either, which is maybe said more what Gaspard is. But um, yeah, Celine, I think she's maybe a little too much mired in the politics. Briala is a good argument though, because Briala seems like in some way maybe she's she's portrayed as being the best choice. She's like the combination of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think the whole like ruling from the shadows thing sort of in- interjects a sort of inherent unfairness. It's like, it's one thing that you don't have a democracy. It's another thing that even your monarchy isn't transparent. Like that's kind of weird to me. Have Now question. I, Cause I pulled it out here. <clears throat> have you read the mass empire? I have not. Is there information in there that would change my mind? This is literally about the dynamics between Celine Briala and Gaspard. Okay, so I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I well here, here's the thing though. I think it is a little bit unfair that uh, like I people's mind change after you read this thing. Like how like it, it's kind of weird to have a whole bit of like pretty important lord for your choices all wrapped up into how long is this book like 300 pages or something yeah almost 400 page novel so like it's at the same time one of my favorite novels of the series so i i don't like mind it but uh it also kind of is iffy well to Um, that point just to interject real quick mass effect initiation i've said if you don't read that book you don't really understand alec Ryder, cora or in Mm -hmm. a weird way even sam from like I really feel like a lot of the Cora haters would like her more if they read Initiation. And out, out of curiosity, <clears throat> does she talk a lot about the Asari? Like I, I know this is half <laughs> a joke, but I, I am generally curious. No, she does. I mean, she mentions it right. Like before, she leaves that detail to come to the um, initiative, and yeah, that's kind of how the it doesn't start with her being with the Asari. It starts with her basically joining the initiative. But she talks about how more in depth of what she mentions in the game her her mentor thinks that she needs to i don't want to spoil the book she out of her relationship with alec Ryder and what he expects from her it's what it's exactly what her former mentor wanted for her okay. Cor, cora wasn't really believing in anything she was just kind of like an overachiever like an a student who doesn't have a lot of passion mm-hmm. and her mentor knew that she was never going to get that really with the Asari. Like she needed something that because she because in some sense because she wasn't Asari. Like this isn't yours, and you've adapted really well to a culture that's not technically yours and everything. It was like, but you need to do something that's like your mission, your personal journey. You're always going to be sort of in our shadow here. So she kind of forced her out uh, to go to the initiation, and then she kind of felt like, oh crap, well crap. Well now I'm in Alec Ryder's shadow, but uh, I like Alec a lot more in the book as well. Like he's hmm. still tough and kind of hard nosed, but. In a weird way, it's almost like he's a better father to Cora than he is to his own kids. And he's tough on her, but he kind of gets the same idea of, like, you need to be the star of your own show. Like, you need to grow. You need to do this and that. I like I like the book a lot. <clears throat> I muted that mic, but not this mic. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay. Uh, well, I thought, I've been thinking maybe I want to start reading the Mass Effect books just to, like, understand those things. But that's further down the road anyway let's uh back, back to, the to dragon topic. age yeah um so i i guess at, i think at, at this point let's just discuss the rulers each of them um gaspard let's start with him now in the book like i i actually think he comes off a lot better in the book um like he's very honorable like there's a whole like i'm just gonna spoil the book here by the way i'm just <laughs> Growing up. Is it, or, or do you mind, Jordan, if I spoil the book? I should no, no, that. go for it. My reading list okay. is full enough. I'm, if I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it down the road. That's fair. Uh, one, one of like uh, the major scenes in the book is that... Um, uh, oh, do you, Okay, so when you go to uh, Empress du Leon, there's like this blonde-haired guy that's like, oh, I got to defeat M. Shale at the castle. You know that guy? Wait, say it again. Um, so there, okay. When you go to Empress du Leon, there's uh, this guy, guy called uh, M- Michel Michael Deschavin or whatever, um, and he's like this Orlesian blonde guy with a sword. He's like, we gotta go get the keep and defeat Imshale and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. He's in the book. He was originally um, Celine's like champion, and so like him and Gaspard are fighting, and then like uh, there, there's this whole plot I'm not going to go into, but Briala essentially gets him to stop fighting, and Gaspard doesn't, you know, 
kill him for whatever reason be- because he's very honorable. He doesn't want to um like like, like he was a cheval- chevalier and he like still really holds to the honorable code. Like he's not going to kill someone who stopped fighting type of thing. So he's he's actually a pretty good dude. I th- I, I think in Inquisition he comes off a lot more assholeish than he actually does in the novel. Um, and, and he technically wants the crown because it was supposed to be his to begin with. And then Celine sniped it away from him because when she was around 16 years old, she did this huge power play move and ended up actually murdering Briala's parents, which is why they broke up. Um, <laughs> That'll so, do that to a relationship. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think Gaspard isn't as bad a choice as everyone is afraid of, um, especially those who haven't read the novel. I, I will say, I like one thing I don't like about it, and, and having these thoughts make it questionable as if I should be picking the ruler of Orlais or not, but he definitely wants to invade Ferelden again. That is definitely something on his to-do list, and that's why he wanted to take over and make the Empire great again, so to speak. Um, so I, I think that one reason I don't like picking Gaspard is because I don't want to know their war in Ferelden because I like Ferelden and I like the current king they have. So <laughs> that's probably but the strongest that piece of evidence. Orlais? So like, sh- should the Inquisitor be picking the ruler of Orlais based on the fact that they want Orlais to be weaker, so to speak? I mean, I think I think it raises the overall question of like, I mean, just in general. I mean, you stated it right. Like, why is the Inquisition meddle so much in the affairs of another country? Well, not another country, of a country that they're mm-hmm. that they're having so much influence. I mean, that that yeah, that that really is the question. That I guess from a game standpoint or from a story standpoint, it's like because it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> Dragon Age Inquisition and that that mission, that whole series, I mean that come on. I mean the Winter Palace section of Dragon Age Inquisition is one of my favorites. I mean it in the entire Same. series. It's so good. It's just so good. I I, I like a lot of people hate it though. I I'm not one of those people. I love it. That's my favorite mission of the entire game. I think you too. So it's No, you I get a mod get for the for outfits it. and it's perfect. The only thing that's uh, wrong so with it is the outfits. You get a good dress mod. Mwah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess, like, with Gaspard, what you're signing up for is more military action, a, someone who's less into, like, the game, so he's going to be a little bit more honest with his dealings, which is something you might want, and then also, um, probably wants to ferrate, ferrate it in Belden, Jesus Christ, invade Ferelden, (laughs) um, and maybe even a little bit of Navarra, because they've been, there's a city near the edge there that's been iffy. So he he could possibly start a lot of wars, which <laughs> I think I think invading Ferelden is definitely the downside. Like that's the strongest downside for him. I think another one mm. of the things that I thought about in that is more should there be a Tevinter invasion? Mm. Like you want Gaspard in general. I see what you mean. Okay. Also Kinari. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, if you want someone who's going to have a very strong military aspect because Thetis is gearing up for something bad, then Gaspar is probably going to be the guy you want. Um, a- another thing is that like the the nobles, it, I I'm like ninety nine percent sure on this, but it's been a while since I've listened to the ending slides on this. But the the nobles are more for Gaspar than the other two rulers, um, b- because like they they want Orlay to be great again. They want to be a, like a big you know political power of Thetas, because right now it's kind of fallen a little bit. Um, now, let's go on to Selene. What Selene has done, instead of doing a lot of the political stuff, she tried to make peace with the nations, and in in the past couple of years there's been a lot more, like, cultural wins, so to speak. So, like, um, there's there's been more paintings, and um, more arts and sciences, and uh, she's put on a lot more plays, so it's a lot more cultural stuff being built up in the nation. And, and and again, more friendly with the the others like Ferelden and whatnot. Like she almost married uh, Kaylin, so until he died. <laughs> there's like the intelligent, rational part of me that recognizes how important it is to have cultural advancements, and then there's the, then there's like the dude bro trapped inside of you going like, "What are you gonna do? You're gonna throw paintings at the Tevinters? You're gonna throw?" <laughs> a... <laughs> well, what's the uh, um, Queen? Asha, is that her name, of Antiva? But there, there is one queen of Antiva where um, she, her, 
uh, she wanted to make Antiva a giant political powerhouse. And the way she did that was just have a bunch of kids and then through connections marry them off to all of the important people in Thetis. So now everyone is family. And now uh, no one wants to attack Antiva because their wife is from Antiva or their husband's <laughs> from Antiva. So That's good. Like I, I think uh, Celine's even uh, slightly Antivan because of because of that that union. So it's it's probably as we get further away from that point, it's not going to be as effective. But like apparently her bloodline run, runs in uh, uh, Celine, Sebastian, a bunch of Tevinters. Like there's a whole bunch of people. You know, to that point, if I if I were to, more seriously on on the on the aspect of Celine or the benefit of expanding the culture, like if I were to treat that subject more seriously and also kind of put my political hat on, there's a very prevalent idea in the real world that politics follow culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, culture leads politics, so to speak. And so I, I could I could see that, even though this is more speculation, I don't know that there's necessarily something in the game or the books that confirms this, but that something like that is almost like a macro level of the game itself, right? So under Celine, the game is getting better, more refined, new levels to it are being uncovered. So that mm-hmm. if you have, if, you, if, if Orlay is sort of driving an export of plays, like you said, art, all these other things, um, you lead the culture, right? And so in that point, you end up leading politics across Thetis because you have this mm-hmm. cultural influence. Like that could be a really like high level, next level way to interpret Celine's value. Because mm-hmm. apparently Orlais is currently leading in cuisine and fashion, like all over Thetis. And if people are start eating the Orlesian, wearing Orlesian, then, yeah, like, don't they invade them. They're cool. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it can work too. And so I, I don't I, I think Celine's actually pretty decent. Um, Briala is the interesting one because one to get her to rule, she needs to like puppet master Gan or Ganon, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we just jumped game series. <laughs> well, puppet master Ganon's like a thing anyway. But like uh, 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 Gaspard, um, but uh, like she has no ruling experience it, besides like she was lovers with uh, Celine for a very long time. Uh, pretty much her entire life since they were they were both kiddos, um, and like they, she, so she she has seen Celine do it and she has helped Celine do it so she knows how but she doesn't actually have done it yet, um, and and then also her main thing is about the elves. She obviously cares for Olay and her nation, but she is for the elves. All of her anything is going to be pro elven. So if you're pro elven, and that's all you care about, then Briala is your gal, but other than that, there's really nothing going for her as far as like or something for Orlay goes and benefits for Orlay. It's just better treatment of elves, but there's going to be a lot of backlash within the country and the nobles, and there might be a lot of chaos within the the nation. Does it feel in some sense, I mean, if you were if you were looking at it purely from a humanitarian standpoint, I kind of feel like that's the way the game frames it by default, is she's mm-hmm. the only true humanitarian pick, because otherwise the elves are going to continue to suffer. Do I read too much into that, or do you kind of agree with that? Or at least that's what the game is trying to present. I, I think it's close to that, but she definitely has this side of elves before humans a little bit. But I, I think that um, it's, so it's int- with Briala, you can't put her on the throne yourself. You either have to go through Gaspard or you have to go with reuniting Celine and Briala. I think that if she's alone with Gaspard, she definitely still has that mindset of elves before humans, like my people before yours, because they have been so downtrodden or whatever. But if you reunite her with Celine, which there's a whole other aspect of should they get together in a relationship aspect, but that's another story. Um, it, she has, she has like this softened of now, now it's going to be a more compromise of like the two of, of Celine's way of thinking and then the humanitarian way of the elves with Gaspard. She's just going to do it without, you know, compromise or whatever. And that could lead to a lot of chaos. So I think in a way reuniting her with Celine kind of would probably control that a little bit better. So, and like ease it in and probably make it easier for the society to, to handle it. And it was already kind of going that way. So before the events of the Masked Empire, like if, if nothing had happened, if there, if, if there wasn't a uh, Gaspard going in and trying to steal the throne, if there wasn't, um, you know, the whole thing with the Alluvians that's in the book, it, Celine and Briala would probably be the way Orlais was going to go. So if you wanted to continue Orlais on the trajectory it was, that's, that's the choice you want. So, 
That makes sense. Do you think there's an argument? I don't know if there's an argument for this, but does Briala feel like the best spy out of all of them? Like, even in a way better than Celine or better at the game? Because I kind of feel like Gaspard and Celine know about each other, right? They're kind of like the known players. And, and obviously, at some point, they start to, you know, they know Briala's in there, but she kind of seems mm-hmm. like. The fact that the fact that she's able to mastermind it somewhat from the shadows, I don't know. I kind of I've always sensed her as being like the best spy out of all of them. I think in the book it also frames her as that because um, on, on top of um, it, at, le- at least in the novel, she it's it's kind of hard to describe without going into the whole thing, but she makes a power move and betrays Celine at the very last second while there's still a couple. Mm-hmm. So it's it's she she uses their relationship to essentially gain control of the Alluvians, um, and it's uh, so, so so with the Alluvians and then with like the things that she's willing to do, and it also like the book kind of has this weird like parallel where it's trying to say that uh, Briala is a lot like Fenharel's or Solas I guess, so and and they think a lot of the same, and so if if Solas is supposed to be the best spy there was because he brought down like I don't know however many elven gods and Briala is supposed to be very similar to that then yeah she probably would be the better spy out of the other two that's a good point um what are their greatest I guess I guess as we we've kind of covered each of them in summary so it seems like Briala like you said kind of a no-brainer for the elven playthrough I think that was the one time when Mm -hmm. I did it um What's her greatest? I mean, what's the bit major drawback? I feel like Gaspard's major drawback is the guy wants to, like, he actively wants to invade another country, which is probably mm-hmm. not good in general. Um, and the, well, I mean, what's the major drawback for Celine and Briala? Um, the the major drawback for that one is that people, it's it's pretty common knowledge that they were lovers, and that's very scandalous. So now, if they learn like if they see them around all the time because like at the end when you when you reunite them both of them come up and give a speech the rumors are going to start flying right so it's it's i i think with that that the the people already don't really like celine because she has the the weaker or lay so if if she's already like you know sleeping with an elven woman and whatnot and that's really scandalous there's going to be a lot of um backlash like bards being sent for her and assassins like people are going to want to get her out so it's it, it in a way okay c- kind of think of it as what's going on in our own political climate where people really don't like donald trump so th- think of that but in our lay with selena briala there would be up there would be upheaval sort of of the political po- climate entirely if they were yeah because how dare she like be, like the elves are basically slaves, like they're kind of paid, but it's not much. So if if trying to treat them better, it's going to like, you know, oh, now we have to pay my servants more or whatever. And it's going to be kind of hard to do that. People are going to get their panties in a wad. So that's kind of where it's where it is. But isn't Celine the status quo, though? I mean, technically, she's still the empress. Yes. People don't like her. <laughs> because there's that. So, the, yeah, I guess, um, no, I, I see what you're saying. I think on a, like, sort of a meta list. So which one do you, which one is, like, your favorite pick? I think I'm still going to say Gaspard, and I'll say why kind of in a second. And then maybe, mm-hmm. and, then, and then I think I can segue us into another one. Um, well, there's there's one more choice we haven't gone over yet. The truce. Go over the truce for me. So you, you can actually, if you get enough information of all three of them, you can make all three work together as one giant emperor. I don't know if I've ever done. I said I've never done this. Yeah, it's it's um it, it's a weird one because like Celine and uh, Briala don't get back together, and it, it's not like Briala working in the shadows. But now they they have this. Essentially, what it is is that the Inquisitor has so much blackmail on the three of them. The Inquisitor is almost manipulating them to do what's best for the Inquisition, if that makes any sense. So it's it's a very big power play. Um, my, my as much as like that one's cool, especially if you're playing a power-hungry Inquisitor, the problem with that one is as soon as you disband the Inquisition, there is nothing keeping those three together, and they're going to fall apart. 
So this is so this is perfect, right? Because that, that's kind of the direction that I was going. I'd forgotten mm-hmm. about that one. I don't think I've ever done it. I think the most I did was I looked up how to do it at one point, but I don't think I mm-hmm. did. Um, my sort of like meta level commentary on it was so if we talk about a power hungry Inquisition, I don't know that a truce mm-hmm. makes sense. Uh, like like if we're looking at it on a macro level of politics, I think if you were I think if you were playing role playing a power hungry Inquisition. Mm-hmm. You probably do go with Gaspard, right? Because like a really a really stable Orlay is not necessarily conducive to a power hungry Inquisition. If Orlay's let's say let's say Orlay is like has this equilibrium, and so then they have like a really stable relationship with you know Navarra and Ferelden. It's like I actually kind of I'm more of the mindset of like the more stable things are in Thetis, the less the Inquisition is needed, and the less mm-hmm. they can sort of make a power play. You kind of want things like not total chaos but just kind of like in a in a semi state of unrest and then mm-hmm. the inquisition's sort of value is sort of raised in that way mm-hmm. so either way like i mean it's this isn't necessarily evidenced in the content of the game this is more just me extrapolating but like if you had a ruler that was somewhat beholden to you or at least friendly towards you which you get no matter who you pick they're kind of friendly towards you in return but in particular, Gaspard sort of having notions of invading Ferelden. But in my opinion, that move would be preempted by either a Cunari or a Tevinter invasion of the South in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of feel I kind of feel like that that sort of state of unrest kind of plays to the Inquisition's favor. But you also make a good point. Like if you're going to disband, then that almost seems irresponsible because those three are just going to tear each other apart once you're disbanded. Yeah. That's that's what I think at least. So my my personal favorite of the three of them is reuniting Briala and Celine, because I I liked how Olay was going. I liked the piece. I like Ferelden how it is. Again, probably not what the Inquisitor should be thinking, but that's the truth. Right. And then also I like playing the Elven Inquisitor, so putting that in there as well. So I'm that's my canon choice of Celine and Briala together. I think there is a great argument to say that they shouldn't get back together because it's a very unhealthy relationship because Celine did murder a whole bunch of elves just to say, just to prove a point that she wasn't sleeping with Briala, which was a lie. And then Bri- uh, Celine also killed Briala's parents. But at this point, it's not even about if they should get back together. It's what's best for Orle. And at that point, it's them, it's them banging boots. So. Yeah. <laughs> banging boots. What a great, I mean, that's a great observation, right? Relationship bad for them, good for the country. Mm-hmm. Therefore, <laughs> you guys are so. getting back together. And they still love each other, apparently. So, like, you know what? Like, it's a bad relationship, but everyone else is happy. So, you know, I'm just going to show it over there and don't think about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess my my canon one really is still Gaspard. Although I I I'd like Celine and Briala depending on on the different role plays that you might try. I just think you kind of want Orlay to be propped up enough because because how far back is the Orlesian Ferelden War from the like mainstay events of Origins? And it's like twenty years, right? Uh, I know about forty years because it well a little little less than that because the. Uh, um, I, I think it was freed in, like, the fourth year of the Dragon Age or something. Like, it was pretty young into the Dragon Age where uh, Ferelden gained its freedom. So, like, it's only, like, f- you know, 35, 40 years since, uh, for Fer- Ferelden. You know, like, m- most of Ferelden population that's an adult, like, they remember the war. So... So I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong then, right? Like maybe maybe you don't necessarily need such a firm hand for Orlay. I don't know why my tendency is just to say keep Orlay slightly more nationalistic and slightly and have sort of like a firmer military. Somehow I don't know. I can't I can't even articulate as to why, but somehow I feel like the balance in Thetis is better if Orlay kind of is weighing down their end of the scale i don't know if i'm butchering this explanation but it's just like somehow they need to be strong in order for the balance to be right no i that makes sense to me because it you you have very like the, the two powerhouses of status right now is tevinter and orlay if orlay is weaker then in the next game where we go to tevinter and who knows is happening in tevinter they're not going to really have a, a good like um what's the word, uh, enemy, I guess, other than the Canari, and we don't want them to win either. So 
or lay be- for some reason and, and it, i don't know how it became this way probably because of the chantry but it's kind of been the protector of all the other nations granted it does want to take over for Reldon and navara but it also doesn't want to venture to take over so if it had to choose between taking over for Eldin or defeating Deventer, they would defeat Deventer. And did, that's what everyone else wants. You, you did it right. That, that's that's what I was trying to say, right? Like Orle, Navarra, and Ferelden, although unlikely allies, are still more likely than anyone siding with Deventer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, which uh, another, like, I don't want to go get too much into this right now because that's probably another episode, but something you would probably have to consider as well is who is on the throne for Ferelden because Anora, um, Alistair, and Anora, Alistair, the Warden, whatever combination you have of those, they're going to react differently to Gaspard, Selene, Briala as well. So. Ooh, yeah. Anora, Gaspard, to me, is not a good. No. Well, also, uh, I, I don't, like, Selene highly respects Anora because she, she recognizes that she's a bad bitch and she's like, ooh, I like her. <laughs> but um, she thinks Alistair's kind of a buffoon and Alistair's is really, like Alistair on his own is really not good at, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, uh, Diplomacy? There it is, diplomacy. He's, he's, he's kind of not into it. He's a little bit sharper. So it, I, I think technically the better choice for, for Elden is having a Nora to do the diplomacy and then Alistair to do the hard stuff, but that's another story. So it, it kind of depends on who you have on the throne. But There's so many angles to this. It's fun. Uh, so I guess, are we satisfied somewhat on, I'm kind of still leaning more towards Gaspard, you're saying Celine and Briala together? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, like, I, I think Gaspard, for those reasons, are, are just fine. And, like, I, but I still prefer my reasons of, like, I, 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 I think it's very valid, the, the reasonings you're putting on, but I think I just prefer to not even take the chance. Because, like, I think if, if I were to project where the series is going, Tevinter's not going to invade the rest of Thetis. Tevinter and Canary are going to have to have a war. So it doesn't, I, I don't think it's going to be an issue, but it might be. So that that's me being me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> No, it makes sense. Like I said, I've done Briala with the Elven playthrough. I did Selene in, in my earliest ones. I think Selene was the first one, right? Like Selene just kind of made more sense. And then mm-hmm. I don't know when I started moving more towards Gaspard. But mm-hmm. um, we've already kind of touched on it. And I kind of feel like it relates into what we're talking about, which is whether or not the Inquisition should disband. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, I th- it's, it's one of those choices where we we don't know the results yet. And I think that's a big issue on what you want to choose in the future. Like whatever the next game comes up, I think there's going to be pretty clear what we want. If we want it like, Oh, we, we start playing the game like, Oh shit, I shouldn't have disbanded or Oh shit, I should have. So I, I think that as of right now, we don't have too much to go on. Is there anything else like that? I'm trying to think of the comparison. I was like, I would say the wardens. Wait, no, I mean, as far as, I'm sorry, I mean, is there anything else like that as far as DLC in a Bioware game leading into the sequel? Oh, uh, technically, um, Legacy, because of Corypheus. Um, okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, it, in a sense, but does it really make much of a difference, right? Because he, he pops up either not, way. Yeah, not really. Um, like, I'm trying to think of the implications of... Because I would love for it to be, like, a major difference. Even if it's not a major mm-hmm. branch in the story, even if it's just the first cutscene somehow is either a big battle or a peaceful, you know, whatever. Like, even if it's just mm-hmm. somewhat superficial, as long as there's a big distinction based on whether or not you disbanded the Inquisition because, you know, like, okay, so, like, Legacy. Technically, it leads into the into the next game, but mm-hmm. you're in the same place no matter what. Um, yeah. a- Arrival in Mass Effect 2. I love that DLC. Technically, it sets up the beginning of Mass Effect 3, but Shepard's in the same spot. He's under military arrest no matter what. Like, it, you know, you make a choice about whether or not to sacrifice the colony exactly or not, but either way, the same thing's happening. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what's the precedent and how big of a difference are we really going to see in Dragon mm-hmm. Age 4? I would say that the difference would be, like, um, 
uh, it, I, I feel like in my mind what I'm seeing is that the differences is in how people talk about the Inquisition and then also like character models that we see will either be wearing Inquisition armor or like another armor that doesn't belong to the Inquisition. So it's kind of like more soldiers, you see more soldiers and stuff like that. But at least what we've been seeing with the comics, it, it's kind of vague on like how the Inquisition is being handled. So I feel like they're going to, it's it's going to be a difference, but I don't know if it's going to be as big as a difference as we wanted to see. How much time, because I'm not keeping up with the uh, with the comics, how much uh, further ahead are they chronologically? Like, do they do a time jump or is it right after the events of Inquisition? Uh, I don't think Knight Errant. So uh, there's two. Oh, by the way, they just announced a new comic, Dragon Age Deception. Woo. Ooh. Um, but, uh, so I don't know when that one is, but, uh, so there's, uh, Mage Killer. Mage Killer is pretty much set within the Inquisition timeline, so trashing that one. So then we got Knight Errant. That one seems pretty close to the end of Inquisition, or actually, a uh, Trespasser, I should say, because, uh, Varric is Viscount. But, um, it's, it's pretty close, but it's not... I don't think there's a, a giant, like, couple-year time jump. I think at the very maximum, it's a couple months. So. Gotcha. What do you feel about Inquisition disbanding or not disbanding? So, I I think my major choice here kind of is combined with how I played the game. When I started booting up Inquisition, I felt like my character was like, I don't want to lead a giant thing. When was the, before Trespasser even came out, I'm like, when, I want my character to get out of here. I don't want to lead the Inquisition. I want to leave. So, and I, I think Mother Giselle is also trying to like aim for that because she, that, that speech she gives, uh, I, I believe it's in, uh, you know, after Haven is destroyed. And she says, like, this is the time where we need to pick up the sword and we have to be like, we, we can't be like the other Inquisition and keep going on. We have to learn how to lay down our sword. And that's why when you go into Trespasser, you meet Mother Giselle again. And then she asks you very pointedly, what do you want to do? And if you say you want to keep the Inquisition, she gets kind of like sharp with you because she believes that like we like we've we've done we, we've done our mission. It's time to set down. We can't be this random powerhouse because otherwise you're going to be a giant powerful organization and we're going to get too unruly and exactly what the other Inquisition became. So I kind of agree with her line of thinking on that, where we, we've, we've done our job. The world doesn't need a giant, another seeker, another Templar unit. We don't need another Inquisition. We're done. So just let it go. I think that's that, that's how I play it. That's my main feeling on it. I, and I, I go to the exact same thing that you do, which is that at the beginning of Dragon Age Inquisition, like you said, when you're still at Haven, that really seems like the, that seems like the plan. Like, I was actually mm-hmm. almost kind of surprised in Trespasser when they're like, well, you've got this big decision of like, keep the Inquisition or not. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I thought, just like you said, Mother Giselle, um, even Liliana and Cassandra, I, I kind of, I feel like they mentioned it of like, you know, an Inquisition is formed for a specific task. Mm-hmm. And then it, it's disbanded. So I was kind of like, well, no, obviously we're going to disband because that's that's the whole point. Otherwise, we're we're usurping power. Um, so, yeah. And even just personally, it's like this. It, they're very problematic. We just talked about it like they're deciding the fate of Orlay. Mm-hmm. The Inquisition is like this non-governmental, extra-national, pseudo-religious organization, which is like mm-hmm. now the most powerful force in Thetis. And it's like there's just so many problems with that. Um, my, my, my inclination is really to disband. Yeah. I think, I think almost, I think I've done one where I kept it, but yeah, mainly disband. I, I would say that were it not for the soulless thing, it would make no sense other than playing a very power hungry inquisitor to keep it. But I can see now where if you make the argument where the inquisition has a new goal and that goal is to get rid of soulless. If, if that's what you want to make the new goal and you play it that way, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Because it, it the, although when you when you have that little window pop up and you, like you it uh, has the decision like oh the Inquisition if you disband it will be less powerful but more secure versus if you keep it it would be more powerful but less secure because there's spies in your organization. Which when when reading it that way, I had no idea what to choose. Is like oh those both are terrible. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I, I think if you want to go after Solus, and specifically in a way to 
uh, I guess, kill him. <laughs> when, when it's, you know, there's like the friendly option versus like stop at all costs. I think you definitely want to keep the Inquisition for that. So that's, I, I think that's my, de- in defense of keeping the Inquisition. That's the main thing I was going to say as well. I mean, that's that's the big elephant in the room. You've got this incredibly powerful being who who is it's very unclear what exactly his plans are like in in the large sense it's clear what he wants but like how is he going to make that happen Mm -hmm. um that is that is the main justification for it to kind of speak to or to try and justify the power hungry play Mm -hmm. um because i think i think in in the one that i kept it together it even though Solus was definitely part of the rationale, the other part of the rationale is that Thetis is kind of a fucked up place, right? Like, this is one way to read the keep the Inquisition quote-unquote power-hungry, but I think the this, this somewhat noble way to rationalize it is, like, somebody needs to be a referee, right? Not necessarily a ruler, but somebody sort of needs to kind of, like, it, it, I feel like it goes hand-in-hand hand with the keep Gaspard in Orlay because it balances things out better, Um you know, it's just basically trying to maneuver not in favor of any one country exclusively, like not being pro Ferelden or pro or Legion or anything, but just kind of like constantly trying to keep the balance. Of course, that is super arrogant and you're meddling in sovereign nations affairs and all that. It's not that justifiable, but that's kind of my mindset of keeping it. Mm-hmm. Now, c- kind of going on the lines of that, because uh, we, we mentioned it, uh, what, what was your decision on Solus? Uh, no, I redeem him every time. I mean, I just feel like that's the vast majority. It seems like a waste, and also it seems like over... It seems like it's almost kind of a false choice. Um, I just feel like redeem is really, like... It's not really all that... I don't know. What do you think? Do you ever pick the other one, and why? Uh, yeah, I've picked the other one before, because I've done, like, God knows how like, many playthrough. Like, but... and Romance Rage? Is that what motivates it, mainly? Um, no, it's, it's more like, um... Uh, well, I think it depends on your relationship with Solus. So, like, I think both of us kind of have, like, a friendly relationship at the very least where we're like, oh, you know, he, he has this interesting backstory and, yeah, he's done a lot of stupid shit. But, like, I, I at least respect the reasons why he did them. And, like, I don't think he's a bad guy. He just is he has some questionable uh, ways to do the right thing. So I, I, I think that's where we are but then there's other people who are on the line of like it doesn't matter what his intention were he wants to kill us all How? he wants to kill us all <laughs> of course we're gonna <laughs> stop him at all costs redeem him my ass i i think there's also another argument there of like listen this guy couldn't be stopped by like eight elven gods or whatever and then my tiny ass is supposed to stop him. right while my arm is practically falling off while I stand in front of him. Yeah, and like we like if you're, you you might not even be a mage, you know, like it's I, it's yeah. very intimidating. So I I err on the side of redeeming because I find that more realistic. But um, yeah, I get behind this. I I I don't I I don't think like stopping Solus is a bad choice either because I think there could be a lot of like rage there and like this guy wants to kill us. So of course I'm going to stop him at all costs. So I, I I understand it. I just prefer, again, the redeemed choice because it's the one, I romanced him. So I think there's also that like, we could do this together because I like problematic relationships in my video games. But um, also, uh, I don't see how we could kill Solus. I don't like I, I think if you're going to choose to stop at all costs, I think best case scenario, we trap him behind an alluvian. I don't think there's like yeah i i don't i don't know i really feel like i would feel differently about it if there was like a stab solace in the face option almost maybe kind of more like morrigan at the end of witch hunt i mean because you almost Mm -hmm. try to kill her like you can throw the knife and hit her in the back or something like that no you stab her in the stomach oh wait it's it's not a knife throw right it's like a stab and then she you you like go up to her and was like hey buddy what's up and then you just shank her right in the stomach (laughs) Yeah, like, to me, that actually feels more consequential. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I just, I feel like the soulless thing is like, ooh, I'm gonna get you in Dragon Age 4. Like, it's yeah. not as... Not as cool. uh, Which, can I just, like, 
throw that out there. How cool would it have been if they just very simply gave Morrigan two body textures and one of them had a giant scar on her stomach? Wait. You're talking about, like, for Inquisition? Like, how yeah. she appears in Inquisition? Yeah, because, like, you can see her tummy. You can see where she stabbed. So if she, if you chose to stab her, just have, like, a, a faint oh, little scar right. where she was stabbed. That's I don't know why I was thinking of uh, uh, her, because, like, of her, how she appears uh, at the Winter Palace. She's in a dress. Oh. I'm like, you can't see her midriff. I'm like, no, 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 no her no, normal, no. her rags outfit, her wilds outfit. Yeah, yeah. but that she's somehow, I like... One, after having a baby, you're still wearing that props. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I know people are like, oh, it's so cold. Though you show off that body, girl. I'm proud. <laughs> She's out there doing crunches in the wilderness. Yeah, she uh, went into get- no stretch marks. I, That's magic right there. <laughs> that is magic. That is some serious witchcraft. Mm. Um, anyway. I mean, if- I mean, how old is... Do they actually talk about that? Because I like in how in Witcher, like, they're actually upfront about how the fact that all the sorceresses are, like, hundreds of years old and they look <laughs> all about 25. Um, She's... Uh, I, th- I think she's supposed to be around, like, early to mid-20s in Origins, so she's probably in, like, her 30s to early 40s in uh, Inquisition. So... No, the thing that I like about the fact is, like, she is aging. Mm-hmm. Like she actually lo- she ages. I mean, so you actually see the difference that, that the ten years brought between Inquisition and Origin. She looks slightly older. I mean, still mm-hmm. obviously, as you said, magical Very shape. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually like the fact that with her and Liliana, you can actually tell that there's a little bit of aging. Uh, I, think, Colin I still as well. think Liliana looks a little bit not as old as she should look, but I, maybe she just has. Well, she did on. come back from the dead. Well, technically, yeah. could have come back from the dead. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she might be a weird Illyrium Echo, which that's an, a, a, an event. But anyway, um, Solus. Uh. <laughs> yeah, Solus, I just feel like n- I understand there's implications for it, but I feel like that's all it is. It's implications. And at that point in time, I kind of feel like it, unless I had the stab him option then and there, I feel so disempowered with the, I'm going to get you as you are quite literally falling to your knees in agony. And then the guy has Mm -hmm. the good graces to help you with your arm problem anyway. Mm -hmm. It just, it actually feels really weak and ineffectual to be like, I'm going to stop you. Oh, could you please help me with my arm right quick? (laughs) (laughs) Which the animation they have for like the, the enemy versus friend versus lover, like arm takeoff moment is great. I don't know if you've, you've seen the differences between them. Uh, I, no, I mean, I, I think I have, but I've never done the, my romance one that I'm technically still in the middle of. I haven't gotten a trespasser yet, so I have not mm. seen a soulless romance one. Well, I, do you want me to spoil what happens in the soulless romance one or? No, okay. no, I want to see this That's now. No. But, but for the, uh, friendly versus enemy for friendly, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, I'm really bad with explaining things. And I'm also going to be motioning this and you can see me. So this audio portion is probably going to be a bit shit, but, um, like you, you, as a friendly inquisitor, you kind of like. Put, he says, like, can I have your hand? And you put it out, and he, like, just kind of grabs it and then, you know, does the thing. Yeah, that's the, the one that I've away. seen. For the enemy Inquisitor, he didn't ask. He just yanks your arm, and you, like, go forward, and, like, you lurch a bit, and then he, like, gets rid of it. Like, he he just, it's very kind of a violent animation. So. Yeah, he's just a little salty about getting punched in the face, yeah, it's all. A little, bit, <laughs> a little bit. So, um, which, which, have you ever threatened to punch Solus at that moment? I don't know if I've... No, you're saying that you can threaten to punch him in yeah, the Trespasser yeah, showdown? Yeah, there, there's a, an option where you can say, like, hit him or whatever if you're you're not very good. And you, you could, like, scream and, like, so you, your quizzer starts to go for it. And then, like, his eyes... He just very calm. He stands there, you know, with arm, arms behind his back. His eyes glow. And then suddenly you're, like, even in more pain. He goes, oh, shit. <laughs> like, he, he can kind of control your amount of pain at that moment. So. Yeah. Yeah, we got. I, I'll, all I will listen. I'll, I'm willing to abandon everything else on my wish list in Dragon Age Four as long as there's an option to punch Solus again. <laughs> and you it's not because I don't him. like so. Like I like. Well, you know, tough love, right? Like we got. <laughs> oh, okay. I like Solus. I just I don't know why. I lo- I love that animation and like the the his reaction and the facial <laughs> animation when you punch Solus is so priceless. <laughs> The only the only thing I want is like where you punch him and he has that exact same expression and then it waits a beat and then you punch him again. <laughs> <laughs> and then he can do whatever he wants after that. He can go all Fen Haral and just tear you limb from limb. I just, you know. Oh, man. What if, uh, so I, I would want to see him like go like turn into wolf form. You do that, but he's in wolf form. 
Wait, so you're going to punch a giant wolf? Hell yeah. <laughs> and he has that, like, same animation where, like, his head whips back and goes, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> How dare! Because <laughs> that's, I don't know, I feel like, I, I, I don't, I feel weird saying this because it's a little bit, ah, but it was such a, like, kind of feminine response to it, in my opinion. Like It, it, it was so the opposite of his sanctimony that he puts on yeah. throughout the entire game, right? So that's why it was so satisfying. He's so <laughs> smug. He's so, like, above it all. And then when you smack him, he's like, <gasps> yes. Why did you do that? That was my cheek. Like, he's not, he was definitely not used to being punched. So I would love to see the wolf form do that. You just see, like, this giant, like, monstrous wolf, like. <laughs> like, I would, like, this is, like, we're going off on this topic now. But, like, on, on that on that sort of thing of, like, I don't mind, like, a player getting put in. Like, I can imagine if the player had the option to punch Blackwall. Like, it would not go that way, right? Like. You can punch Dorian. I've never done that. You you mentioned that the last time. I've never yeah. punched Dorian. I imagine Dorian, you know, that could go a bunch of different ways. Like, Iron Bull, not going to happen. Mm. Sarah, yeah, nice try, mm. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, mm. But anyway, Solus. Yeah, I think I think mainly just Redeem. I feel like that feels like the right thing at that point in time. To me, the, the point in time to, if you're going to do it, if you're going to stop him at all costs, like that, I might choose that when I feel like it's going to be of more consequence in Dragon Age 4. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, do we, do you want to go with uh, what's the, what's the next choice you want to talk about? Probably the wardens. The wardens are the one that I feel like I don't have a, a strong canon choice on because I, I think there's a solid argument either way. Um, what 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 do you prefer, if anything? I think that they're problematic. They're problematic in a lot of the same ways that the Inquisition is, and so I feel like I have this odd double standard. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not quite a double standard. And I think the reason for that is because presumably uh, blights are still going to happen mm-hmm. um, until, until I mean, that, that gets into the whole higher level of like how many old gods, spirits are there. And then, you know, you've done videos on that, et cetera. It's like, but presumably like, there's still going to be more blights. Mm-hmm. And so there should still be wardens. Uh, as for who, I think it's a big thing about who leads them. I feel the best when Alistair is not king. And mm-hmm. so then Alistair, you can kind of say that he's going to be the one leading them. I think that that works overall the best. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd lean towards, you know, um, not sacrificing them, trying to keep them around, and then hopefully having Alistair lead them. So with uh, um, joining the Inquisition, then. Yeah, I think I think I think you roll them into the same. Mm-hmm. Although although I mean there's there's a point because what is it they're quote unquote banished right or they're sent off. Yeah, they're either thrown out of I think it's just Orle. I don't know if it's Ferelden too, but they either you either banish them back to wherever they came from, uh, or they join the Inquisition with the forces. Yeah, I think rolling them into the, into the Inquisition, it makes sense. But then to me, like, even if you disband the Inquisition, I don't know. I guess that gets kind of muddy, right? Are you disbanding the Wardens also? No, like, they, they just kind of go back to, uh, not Weishaupt, but uh, Admin Fortress and chill out there. Yeah. So there, there so there's um, the, the, the big thing in my mind that, like, I think kind of influences this decision for me a little bit is that at the very end of the game, um, the... Wardens are all of the wardens in Thetis are called back to Weiss out. That's a lot. If you don't dis, if if you uh, exile the wardens, they're obviously already at Adamant or uh, Weiss out. Sorry, but um, if you if they're with the Inquisition, they don't go. They're the only wardens that go. Yeah, we're fine over here. We don't like we we we're, they they kind of divorce themselves away from the wardens. So you technically now have. The giant big group of wardens and the people at Adamant. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Like, we don't know what's going on with the wardens. We're already, like, kind of a little bit iffy on what's going on with them and the civil war that could be happening. Meanwhile, the people at Adamant are just, like, you know, sitting there, like, smoking and drinking and be like, eh, who gives a shit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we fine over here! <laughs> so... Um, see, I, so I, I think with that regard, I kind of like the tiny cell of wardens that if these people all explode and destroy each other, at least we got these guys. So I, that's, that's kind of how I see it at the same time. Like 
it it kind of sucks that this was never even brought up in the game. Um, but Corythius can still control wardens. He still has like that mind control thing. So having them on your team seems like a really bad idea. But they never explored that at all. So it in I I think the weight of the choice of like you have a, a this little cell of wardens that's protected from whatever the civil war is going on, but you also have them like your the inquisition is more manip like be easily manipulated. They don't mm. really explore that side, so it almost seems like th why disband the wardens unless you want all the wardens together. It's yeah, you're right. the The consequences of it aren't explored enough. I think, mm -hmm. and so I guess. In that regard, maybe I would feel differently if you could see the consequences a little bit more. As like, say, of the Corypheus control. I just, I, I, I think the reason why I have the double standard sort of in how I think of the Wardens and how I think of the Inquisition is because the Wardens have been around for so damn long. Mm -hmm. And it's just like there's this, you know, there's this sort of like really old organization that has a really important function that's going to come up again. Mm -hmm. Somehow that the if you can if you can do if you can take steps to preserve them you should I mean I think there is an argument that maybe best preserving them is sending them out of Orle for their own good mm -hmm. and not having them join the Inquisition but then when you bring up the aspect of like what happens towards the end where they're all sort of gathering at Weishaupt uh, that's probably not good <laughs> whatever's <laughs> going on there that's probably not good so it might be good to have a cell broken off that could maybe you know preserve themselves, preserve the history of the warden, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that's an another thing, like if you wanted to, uh, you know, keep Orle strong, having wardens in their borders just in case a blight breaks out would probably help keep Orle strong. So. Would the nobles feel that way, given their history with the wardens? Orle's been pretty like, cool with our, like uh, the wardens. Like, they, they don't, like, uh, Ferelden hates the wardens because of the coup, and that's a whole other story. But uh, Orle is, like, they're they're pretty friendly with it. Now, pretty much everywhere, um, because the there's, there was, uh, it was kind of brought up in Dragon Age 2, but there's rumors that the fifth blight wasn't really a blight because it was so short. So, it there there's, uh, people are saying that it was a, a, a warden, um, uh, uh, conspiracy theory to try to like make people remind like remind people that the wardens were so important and needed um but that regardless be before the fifth blight people were thinking that the wardens were just kind of you know useless there's no more blights the last blight was the last one like we don't need to worry about it anymore it was kind of useless so people but like they were still around it's it's, it's this weird thing where like or or lay tolerated them but they knew their importance and they, they, they were too worried to get rid of them. When you mentioned that, is there a theory uh, that Flemeth started the Fifth Blight or am I just imagining <clears throat> that? There might be. I, I don't remember one. We, we, we do know that technically the architect started the Fifth Blight because he, he, uh, he found the, uh, the Archdemon and uh, tried to make it take that joining ritual he had to try to free the Archdemon and it didn't work and he just freed the archdemon and started the fifth blight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I mean, like the you know the wardens are concerning also because like they have this you know the treaties are like a weird. I mean, I guess technically they're treaties, so all these countries agreed to it, but like they mm -hmm. seem to wield a lot of power. They're problematic in that sense, but overall, I don't know why. I think maybe it's just my affinity for the warden and uh, Hero Ferelden and Origins mm -hmm. that I'm like, no, the warden's got to stay and be great. <laughs> yeah, it's I. I, I don't trust the Wardens, but I do trust that they at least want to keep Thetis alive. So in that regards, I might not like their methods, but they're the only one. The, they're the only thing that works. So keep them. Like, it, it, like Solus really doesn't like the Wardens. I think there is something wrong with the Wardens and their methods, but we have no other alternatives. So I will have to keep them, you know? They need they need reforming though, right? That's why I feel best when Alistair is a warden, mm -hmm. because like I mean, Inquisition. It's I mean, obviously they they go pretty far in depicting them as being totally self interested. I mean, to the point where it's like blood magic and summoning demons. Well, I mean, whether or not that was them being influenced by uh, what's his face, Corypheus is lackey. Mm. Um, oh uh, fuck, Magister Livimund Erebus or whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but it seems like their their fear is so easily sort of exploitable that their like their self interest is so high. Like they would fuck everything else. Like the warden's got to survive. Um, mm-hmm. That's super problematic. Also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yes, having them join the Inquisition, I think. Uh, problematic and maybe if the impacts were sort of evidenced more in the game I would feel differently but I kind of feel like it's better to keep them close yeah keep your enemies close <laughs> yeah I that's that's kind of what I lean towards doing there, there's definitely just been playthroughs where I'm like man I don't fucking know what what companions do I need the most approval of right now <laughs> and I, I almost feel like if you're kind of metagaming it a little bit like it's kind of almost better to just choose what like approval you need because there like is no effects in the game at all it does not change anything in the story so uh i will say uh oh wait what time how much how much time do we what do we have time to do one more or did we get to all of the ones we wanted to do um we're running we're it's we're getting close but uh there's probably also a lot we have to cut out so if you want to do like a quick one maybe what was the last one uh cole Cole, how do we feel about Cole? Cole, to me, I don't know if I feel passionately about this one, either one, because I don't feel like one is bad. Yeah, I, I that's one. I, Cole's choice is one I really like because there isn't a wrong choice. They're just different. Yeah. So do, do you have a preference, though? Yeah, I think it's more human. I think I just, I, I've, I've leaned that. Is it, but now I'm getting confused. Varric advocates for more human, yes? Yes. And Solus advocates for more spirit. Yes. I think it's just because I like Varric more. I literally think that that's what it comes down to. <laughs> if, like, if I remember correctly, like, he seems happy as a spirit. He seems happy in more, being more human. It seems mm-hmm. like, you know, whatever the kid wants, right? Like, I, I feel like almost like a parent or an older sibling going, like, whatever makes you happy. You know, as long as you're happy, whatever's good for you. But I think I just like Varric more. And Varric, Varric seems like the, the uncle. <laughs> <laughs> in the situation, he's like, ah, I gotta be more human. I'm like, listen to Uncle Varric, be more human. See, I like uh, the spirit better, and I will say originally it was just because of Solus, because I was romancing about the time of my first playthrough. I was like, I don't fucking know. But um, I, I think learning more, reading Asunder, you know, learning, you know, doing all the poo poo, whatever, I, I still lean more towards spirit because it, Cole is not Cole. Cole is a spirit, you know? He just took on someone's personality. Mm. That's kind of creepy when you think about it. Like, if if for some reason it, he didn't, but if the real Cole survived, there would just be two Coles. And I'm sure the other Cole would be kind of freaked out that there's a spirit who looks and acts and thinks just like him. That's a little bit odd to me. And on top of that, the, the spirit of Cole, uh, like... He is a very rare and precious spirit, as Solus explains, where it's compassion. He does a lot of, like, good things for people. Don't you want more of those rather than demons? And then it's, I don't know, it's kind of like a mix of, like, Cole, the person, died. We should let him die. You, the spirits of Cole, need to be yourself. Do the job you're meant to do and like be who you are you don't need to change because this personality you put on died like this personality he's really just kind of reincarnating cole it's 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 kind of strange like that so i I guess that's why i go for more spirit because the cole we meet isn't cole and i don't think he should be that's a very compelling argument so that's that's kind of my reasoning towards it now he is it's they, they kind of explain it that he's happy no matter what, but with human, it's like there's happiness and sadness, and it's that range of emotions, where as he's a spirit, it's just kind of like the flatline, placid, like everything's pretty much pretty good, because oh, that's how all spirits are. And so it's it's kind of like where you want to go. I will also say I like Krem and Meriden more than uh, Cole and Meriden. Like, I, I don't know, I've always saw Cole as this, like, asexual creature to see him talking about, like, you know, making love to a woman. It's like, ooh, I didn't want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it also just because he's young? Is that part of it? No, because he's not that young. Like, he's, like, in his, like, early 20s or whatnot. Like, Is pe- that his age range, like, by canon? Well, it's, I, I think the specific wording of it is that he's, he's... 20 no more like if 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 he's 20 he just turned 20 like he's still pretty young so 
Oh, that's I, interesting. I don't know if it's just maybe his innocence or his boy. I, I always pegged him as like 17, 18, like young. It's, it's, it's never, because it, the only thing we have is an, is a note written from uh, this, this woman in the book of Sunder. And like, she's trying to describe, um, uh, call to herself because she keeps forgetting him. And she just writes that he's 20, no more. Like it's, he, he's, he's kind of in that weird in between stage of teenager and young adult. So it's, he could be 17, 18 and just looks a bit older. So that's interesting. No, your argument for him being a spirit is really compelling. I feel pretty, uh, um, what you call it, not convinced, but I'm definitely swayed by that. Mm-hmm. I, I guess on the other hand, the part of it that I like, cause I hear what you're saying about how like he is a spirit. He's not Cole. I mm-hmm. guess the part of me that is that the human side appeals to is like, I don't know, like in a weird way, maybe I'm totally, as I typically do, reading too much into Dragon Age, but it's just like, is there this weird meta level of like, what is consciousness? What is a person? Like, can he mm-hmm. choose to actually be someone like the coal or essentially like the coal that died? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, does that, is that just, I don't know, there's a part of me that just thinks that that's cool of that happening. But your argument for the spirit uh, side is very compelling. Well, like I said, like it could go either way. Both of them are, I, I think, work as choices. I just, th- I prefer the spirit because I kind of like that message of don't change yourself just because other people are, are find it more easy to talk to coal rather than coal the spirit. So uh, I think that's also more like going into like how I grew up and like I didn't want to change for nobody because I was that kid. So I, I think there's elements of that. But I, I think it's interesting that like those elements of myself are brought into this choice you know, so I, I I think it's one of the more interesting and complex choices in the game. And I wish they had a little bit more screen time of it. But even like what we get is pretty good. Like there's there's pretty strong differences between Cole Spirit and Cole Human. So it's a great choice. And like I said, I like it. And you mentioned it for the same reason. You don't feel like there's a bad choice in there. Like they both have really strong appeal. Mm hmm. Uh, and they both feel really satisfying. Ultimately, it feels like by doing that, you help Cole. Yeah, it's definitely one of the better, like, character choices. Like, I, I can't really think of another character choice that really... Well, maybe Bulls. Uh, but other than that, like, they all kind of, like, feel a little bit empty somewhat. <laughs> Specifically Solus. Like, he have, like, this, you know, really great setup of, like, oh, let him kill the people, let him not, save his friends, save his not, and then it's, like, nothing happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> so killing the mages isn't even in the keep, so whatever all right well i think we got through uh all of the ones that we wanted to discuss today anything we left out anything else we should cover before we close uh if i can think of anything we probably don't have enough time to discuss it so i'm going to say no <laughs> but uh if you if we didn't go over something and you did want to hear us about it we can always go back to it this is one of those things that uh we, we can just go over different choices oh we, we never did go over the well of sorrows or not but like i that's i think too much at this point but um we can definitely, I mean, this is, I mean, this is what Bioware games are all about. Dragon Age has tons of these. Mass Effect has uh, these as well. So absolutely, mm-hmm. like you said, recommendations, right? If people want to hear us talk over certain ones, let us know in the comments, Twitter, mm-hmm. etc. And we can do probably multiple episodes like this. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any, like, news or anything about our channel? No. Okay. I <laughs> I, feel, I keep thinking we need to like advertise for that streaming thing, but we already did it, so it's I don't know why that's on my mind. We might be doing more streaming. Who knows? Stand, maybe, stay tuned. <laughs> TBA. Uh, which we need to talk about that. So. We'll talk about that as soon as we're <laughs> done with this episode. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that, uh, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on YouTube, obviously, under The Exalted March, uh, on Twitter, and on Instagram at The Exalted March. And I'm on Twitter as Gilderthon and YouTube as Gilderthon and Reddit as Gilanon if for some reason you want to come and say hi. Um, if you want to have any uh, recommendations, not recommendations, Jesus, uh, the uh, requests, that's the word I'm looking for. If you have any requests of things you want us to talk about, feel free to send it to either Jordan or I. I do get them. Um, I, I have got a lot of requests, uh, which I have yet to tell you because I'm a terrible person because I've been so busy this past month. I can't believe it's already June. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Um, but uh, yeah, we've gotten a couple of requests. I have gotten them. They're on our list to talk about it, see if we, we actually want to do it or not. But thank you so much for that. Uh, and with that, guys, Daresh Sharon.